The goal of bank regulation is to reduce the likelihood of a financial crisis, a bank run. That's been the goal for 240 years. Uh, and a financial crisis is an event in which households and firms no longer believe that bank debt, uh, private money, is worth par, and instead they want cash uh, en masse, and it's a, it's a run on the banks. The banks, of course, don't have the cash because they've lended, they lent it out. Uh, and so in this contractual sense, the banking system is insolvent, uh, although when the dust settles sometime later, 95% uh, of the banks are fine, and that's been the case in, in every, every crisis. So these financial crises uh, have happened throughout the history of market economies. They occur in advanced economies, emerging markets, and economies with and without central banks, with and without deposit insurance, and uh, they occur with different forms of debt. So the, the challenge here is to explain in some detail what the mechanism is for a crisis that's consistent with these facts, and in particular that it occurs with different forms of bank debt. Okay, so it's, it's not the case that uh, recent crises are idiosyncratic. They appear to be. In the World Bank data set, there's 147 systemic events since 1970. 65% involved bank runs. Uh, the other 35% had blanket guarantees or nationalization. But the bank runs came late compared to the classic timing, say, before there was a central bank. And they not only come late, but they appear very chaotic. Uh, and so they appear to be idiosyncratic. So if the only crisis one knows about is 2007, 2008, and you don't know about any other crisis, then you, as you know, you can draw a lot of lines through one point. And uh, that's, a, that's a bit of a problem. Uh, I'm going to talk later about how this fact that crises in the modern era appear idiosyncratic is going to affect some of the policy decisions. So this is what these things look like. Now, in 2007, 2008, it looked like this also. Uh, it's just that you didn't see it. And one of the insidious things about 2007, 2008 is that you didn't actually see the run unless you were on a trading floor and you actually knew what you saw. So 2007, 2008 looked like uh, the pre-Fed era uh, run. Uh, and um, it, it, um, it, it's this problem that we're going to talk about. So let's start with uh, what banks do. Uh, the output of a bank is debt. Uh, General Motors makes cars, McKinsey makes advice, banks make debt. And in Diamond Dipvig, their debt is for consumption, consumption smoothing, which is one form of liquidity. In my paper with Panacci, debt is for transactions without adverse selection. So in, in, our, in our work, one agent is going to meet another agent and is going to offer a security to buy consumption goods. And we're going to be talking about what properties this security has to have in order for it uh, to, be, to be efficient. And what I'm going to argue is that uh, debt, uh, bank debt is produced to be information insensitive. Took a long time to get to this. Uh, and that means that it's not profitable for any agent to produce private information about the debt. So when I offer the $10 bill to you, you accept it, no questions asked. That's, that's, that's the goal here, right? Now, what does that mean? That, that means, importantly, that we do not want the price system to work. So I'm going to embellish this and add to it. But, you know, market economies are defined by resources being allocated by the price system. Equity markets are more efficient. But there's one thing about market economies. They need short-term debt. It's vulnerable to runs. And we do not want the price system to work. So the fact that we want the debt to be information insensitive is saying that we do not want the price system to work. And when I say we, I mean banks and agents in the economy. So when the price system works, uh, that's going to correspond to a crisis. So what I want to do next is talk about why, why this is. So to do that, let's start uh, with an earlier form of bank debt. This is a free bank note that comes from, comes from Bull's Head Bank. It's a $1 bill. Uh, you can see it's very worn, so it's, it's good money. It's passed through a lot of hands. Uh, this was a form of banking that predominated in about 75 countries, uh, late 18th, early 19th centuries, and we don't, we don't see it anymore. And there's a good reason we don't see it anymore. Uh, and that's because it doesn't have a uniform value. So here's a picture of Planters Bank of Tennessee's note discount in Philadelphia. Okay. So the notes issued by this bank in Tennessee. In Philadelphia, what, it, what is the discount from par? 
So here, it's about, it's about 8%. Now, you can see that this discount moves around quite a bit. Here's the panic of 1837. Here's the state failures of, on, their, on their state bonds. Uh, and here's the panic of 1857. Now, the problem is that this moves around. However, let's start with what is this object? This is a pure discount perpetual bond with an embedded put option, which allows you to ask for par in gold and silver back at the issuing bank. And what's the maturity of this? Well, the maturity is the time it takes to get back to the issuing bank. Okay, so in this example, it's from Tennessee, Philadelphia to Tennessee. And we know how long that would take because we have pre-civil work traveler's guides. So if you back out the implied volatility of this put option, and you look at this put up, and you look at this implied vol in panel data for all these banks and states, you see that this market's efficient in the FAMA sense. Right? So this market is moving around, but, it, but it's efficient. But it's not, it's market efficient, it's not economic efficiency. So economically, this is not, this is not a good uh, situation because when I come and I offer you, uh, offer to buy something from you, what happens? Well, you tell me the discount's 8%, and I say, what, what are you talking about? And there's disputes, and we can't enforce contracts, and so on. And this is not a new problem. So Ricardo, in the use of money, everyone is a trader. Those who are little suited to explore the mechanism of trade are obliged to make use of money and are no way qualified to ascertain the solidity of different banks whose papers in circulation. Accordingly, we find that laborers and mechanics, these are noise traders, of all descriptions are often severe sufferers by the failure of country banks. So what was Ricardo's solution? He wanted, he, he wanted money that had a uniform value, a uniform value. Right? So that's, that's, that's the goal that we're going to uh, try to achieve here. So what am, wh why is that? And why does that have this vulnerability that is the mechanism which causes the run? Right? It's not that they go crazy. There's an exact mechanism. Right? So let me try to give you the intuition for this paper with 3V Dang and Bengt Holmstrom. Okay? I think, I think you know, it's more involved in the paper, but I'll give you the intuition. So here's the payoff on a debt contract. Uh, down here is the backing collateral, portfolio of loans, a specific bond, whatever it is. Uh, and up here is the payoff at maturity, or in a minute I'm going to make it the payoff prior to maturity. Now the main, the main, the main thing that makes uh, debt uh, possibly tradable at a uniform value is that if I can convince somebody that the value of the collaterals over here there's no point in producing information because we're very far away from the kink. Okay? So suppose the collateral is distributed this way. Now, now we're before maturity. The, collateral, the expected collateral value at maturity looks like this. I put these together, and let's ask the question, would it pay you to produce information about this debt? And the answer is, the expected value of that information is the integral of this little blue triangle. It's very small, right? So you don't see a lot of debt analysts. You don't see debt trading in a centralized location like a stock market. Debt's, debt doesn't have prices. We have matrix prices, made up prices. Nobody cares that they're made up. So if the value of producing the information is greater than this triangle, then you're not going to produce information, okay? And that's what we would like the situation to be, right? We want the situation to be such that information is not produced. Right? So let's contrast this with Townsend's debt theory. Townsend is you're monitoring corporate borrowers. And if the state of the world is they default, then you monitor. So in that world, you want the cost of monitoring to be as low as possible. Here, I'm going to show you that we want the cost of producing information to be as high as possible. Okay? So what is a loss of confidence in this world? Well, a shift of the distribution to the left makes this triangle bigger. Right? So if the macro economy worsens and this gets bigger, then one of two things is going to happen. Either I have to reduce the face value of what I'm trading below its conditional expected value so that you buy it, or we just have throw up our hands and have adverse selection. Now, what moves this distribution to the left? Well, that's not a mystery either. Crises and panics happen when the macro economy worsens. And before you had a central bank, it's very clear what happens. Uh, uh, innovation in an index of leading indicators arrives. If it's above a threshold, there's a crisis. It's, there's never a crisis when it's not above the threshold. There's always a crisis when it is above the threshold. And that, that's true in modern crises as well. Right? We have measures of information can predict 
crises in, in the mo modern panels. Uh, so it's, it's not, it's not a, a surprise when you're vulnerable to a crisis, okay? So this, this is the precise sense in which there's a loss of confidence. Suddenly this debt, which is information insensitive, is gonna switch to information sensitive. Now, so that's not the main result of the paper. Uh, that's, uh, uh, you know, the beginning point. Uh, but before we get to the main result, let's just contrast this with equity. So equity uh, is always information sensitive, right? Equity is always information sensitive. It, its value depends exactly on what the collateral is. And so it's traded in a centralized market. Uh, there's lots of analysts uh, and, and academics like to study it. Now, um, so the point of debt here is that when we cush, cut cash flows by seniority, we, we tranche the information, right? That's, that's the point of debt. And it, Ben Malek and Bergman in recent work show that when corporate bonds fall in price a lot, they get near the kink, they become illiquid because they become information sensitive. Now, so what's the main point of the paper? Well, let's look at the loss distribution of debt. So this is the loss distribution on some bond. Most of the time there's no loss. Sometimes you lose the whole amount. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reflect this and I'm gonna put this together with our picture of the contractual payoff on debt. And you can see that it makes this little triangle very small. So the result is that maximal information insensitivity is achieved by debt on debt. So banks don't hold equity, they hold loans. Repo collateral is bonds. Free bank notes had to hold state bonds. So it's always debt on debt, and that's because it reduces this little tiny triangle. Now, um, there's a number of implications here. Obviously, one thing you can see is that this is a lot of work to go through to make the short-term debt be uniform in value. That is, its price doesn't vary. So that when I offer you a $10 bill, you just take it as $10. But it has the problem that, that you can suddenly have the price system work, uh, which, is, which is a crisis. Now, there's a lot of implications from, from this. One is that uh, you want banks to be secret keepers, right? So banks are gonna, in equilibrium, banks are gonna lend to entities that have high information production values. So what is that? That's gonna be consumers, small businesses, and in, in general equilibrium, firms are gonna sort on this. And so banks have historically been surrounded by secret secrecy. Uh, and everything is, is opaque. And the reason it's opaque, again, is because that creates the debt, the backing debt, which is gonna make uh, the money, the money uh, work. Now, so we can immediately see what the regulation is gonna be, right? That, it's gonna follow directly from this argument. Historically, what's usually been done since the 18th century is you require high quality collateral. And I'll, I'll talk about some examples of that. So you say, well, the debt, the debt backing the debt has to be high quality in some, in some sense. Uh, the other approach is to say, well, don't worry about the collateral. We're going to insure the short-term debt. So all the approaches have been one or, uh, or the other of these. Now, collateral. So, for example, Peel's Act of 1844 required that the Bank of England notes up to a certain limit be backed by gold. And that was a problem. It this was suspended three or four times because of banking panics, constrained what the Bank of England could do. In the U.S., uh, free bank notes had to be backed by state bonds, but those weren't riskless, so you still had banking panics. Uh, the national uh, banking era required national bank notes to be backed by U.S. treasuries. And that didn't work either. And the reason is that there was a, there's a hundred-year puzzle about why there's been an under-issuance of national bank notes. And the answer is, well, treasuries have a convenience yield also, so banks didn't want to use all their treasuries. And as a result of an under-issuance of bank notes, demand deposits grew seven times faster in the U.S. than in other countries. That it was the shadow banking of its time. And now we have the BIS is kind of repeating the errors of the past. Um, now, the other approach is insurance. So insurance... Uh, was tried first in New York State, 1829, to insure the uh, uh, banks, but that collapsed uh, in the Panic of 1837. Five other states adopted insurance prior to the Civil War. None of them were successful. There's some heterogeneity in the design. 
Following the panic of 1907, eight states adopted insurance, all of which eventually collapsed. Uh, and then finally, as a populist mandate, not because economists wanted it or bank regulators wanted it or banks wanted it, uh, American people wanted it, uh, the Banking Act of 33 was passed and we got deposit insurance and we had peace for about 70 years. Now, the, the fact that there's all these banking panics, uh, I don't want you to miss the fact that countries can go for long periods of time without a crisis, right? So U.S. did, uh, Canada has. Uh, so it's possible to design systems where you avoid all this, okay? Now, part of this design, um, well, let me finish up with insurance. Well, let's skip, skip that. So part of this design, the main point, the main feature of the design is what is a bank, right? What is a bank? So if you're going to have deposit insurance or collateral claims, you need to know what a bank is, and you need to know what short-term debt is, and you need to prevent non-banks from issuing short-term debt. And these entry restrictions uh, create a charter value, the present value of monopoly rents, and this, this charter value banking economists attach a great deal of importance to because that's the positive thing that you're going to lose if you go under, okay? So, you know, people talk about moral hazard. You know, I did an empirical paper on this. I couldn't find any moral hazard. Uh, it's clear the charter values are very high. Uh, and it's, it, the question is whether having a positive charter value is really a desirable thing because it's, it's something to entice the bank to abide by the rules. Because if you just beat banks with a stick, you have to remember they can exit. They can exit, right? So regulators only, des they only determine one thing. They determine where the banks are, right? So if you want the banks to be where you can see them, it seems that you need to, you need to have charter value. Now, historically, there's been a lot of trouble identifying banks. So, you know, I, I take a longer horizon than I think most people in this room, except maybe Michael, and I can tell you some of the mistakes associated with, with this. Demand deposits. Bray Hammond, it's the last banking book that got a big prize. The importance of deposits was not realized by most American economists until after 1900. So what was the problem? Demand deposits grew exponentially starting about 1870. And there were surveys trying to figure out whether these were really used for transactions and what exactly was this stuff anyway. Although all the banking panics had to do with demand deposits. Before the Civil War, they were in banknotes. People ran out banknotes and get uh, uh, specie. Now they're running to the bank to turn in their checking account and get national bank notes. So it wasn't, it, you know, it seems maybe silly now, uh, but they didn't understand deposits. What about money market funds? Here's a banking system with no capital, uh, it, it, you know, caused by regulation. No, we didn't really recognize these as banks until, until Lehman. So this is another kind of short-term debt. And finally, take a look at this. This is flow of funds data. This is privately produced safe debt as a percent of total privately produced safe debt. Okay, so this is demand deposits, right? As a percent of privately produced safe debt, you can see starting in you know, the late 70s, early 80s, it just goes straight down. Right? This is money market instruments, right? This is repo, money market mutual funds, asset-backed commercial paper. And this is triple A securitizations. Okay. So this is the shadow banking system. This is the banking system that regulators focused on. Now, there's a, there's a few things to notice about this. One is the shadow banking system didn't develop in 19, you know, in 2003. It's been developing over a long period of time uh, and goes along with a lot of other important changes in the global economy. And these two banking systems are symbiotic, right? This banking system relies on the loans from this banking system. Right? So these guys are going to originate loans. We're going to take the loans, turn them into bonds. Those bonds can now be used as collateral, some of which is going to back this stuff. Okay? So this is the short-term debt that was at the root of 2007, 2008. It wasn't this stuff. It was this stuff. Now, um, so you might say, well, uh, flow of funds data, why didn't somebody see this? And the I, I think the answer is that theory determines what you see. Th theory determines what you measure. 
right? And if you don't have a concept of safe debt or what banks produce, it would never occur to you to make this picture. So something that seems very simple, figuring out what, who are the banks and what is the short-term debt turns out to be very hard if you, if you take a longer time perspective. So this history suggests that financial crises are inevitable because the financial system is constantly transforming and there's new forms of short-term debt over a longer period of time than we normally think about. And this, the panic of 2007, 2008 showed how dramatically the, the system can morph. And all these things mean that we, we basically have some big problems. And the problem is that we don't know why there was no crisis in this period. We don't know what forms of regulation work. We don't know what optimal bank regulation is. We don't know whether there's a trade-off between regulation that avoids crises and economic growth, for example. So all the really important questions, I think we, we, we have a lot of trouble answering because we, we have trouble sort of thinking about all this history where these things morphed and caught us unawares. Thank you. Thank you, Gary.